Hey guys, John here. This is the final video. This is not a necessary point for the argument, but it's just some icing on the cake kind of thing. This is uh, point five, which is video six in the case for Rick Santorum. This one is called Santorum isn't as bad as you think. I'm going to give you four reasons. Here are the four reasons Rick Santorum isn't as bad as you think. One, war. Two, pro-life issue. Three, Christian, and four, social conservative. All right. <clears throat> so the war issue. Uh, you know, he's pro-war. He's a hawk. And he wants to go into the Middle East and have a war. And everyone thinks this is really bad. Well, let me tell you why it's not as bad as you think. Now, we can all throw out Gingrich because Gingrich is really a crappy candidate. The real competitors here for your vote, okay, should be Santorum or Ron Paul. Because Ron Paul is a good guy. Santorum is a good guy. They're good in different ways, but let me show you why Santorum isn't as bad as you think. And that's because on this war issue, despite what you may think, he's actually equivalent to Ron Paul. Now let me tell you why he's equivalent. Ron Paul's point is that we need to be aware of our enemies both domestic and foreign, that there's a lot of domestic problems, and that the foreign problems aren't our problem, and uh, they're not actually going to attack us, he's even saying. So let's get out of there, come uh, fix up our domestic area. All right, very cool. Only a few problems with that. One, uh, Iran legit has a nuke, okay? They're either going to get a nuke or they already have a nuke. And they have several threats on record saying they're going to use this nuke against Israel. Now, a lot of people are saying, oh, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't dare. We'd easily overpower them if they ever do that. Yeah, we would overpower them, but they're going to do it anyway. You want to know why? Because there's some crazy Muslims over there. Okay, and this is the fact of the matter. The Ron Paulians don't want to talk about it. They are some crazy Muslims in Iran. And I don't know if you're aware of Muslim doctrine, but basically, if they die because they went to war with someone else, that is like their cloud nine. They go to heaven, they get a bunch of virgins. If they die because they initiated a war, so long as that war was a holy war, which them bombing Israel would be a holy war for various reasons from their point of view, if they die as a result of that, that is better than if they lived out, you know, just the most holy life and died of natural causes. They would rather nuke Israel and then us retaliate and kill them. They would love that, okay? So it's not like they're intimidated whatsoever by the fact that anyone would overpower them. All right, so we need to weight the foreign enemies equal with the domestic enemies, okay? And I don't think there's any real argument about that. The argument is about, um, is this foreign war something that actually needs to be fought? Um, and, and the answer is, yeah, they will nuke us and they are some crazy Muslims. Okay. Uh, and I had some other points on that, but I forgot. Alright, so point two, pro-life. You know, um, Ron Paul is also pro-life, but here's the problem, is it's fundamentally inconsistent with Ron Paul's stance. He's a libertarian. Now, if he was a pure libertarian, he would be pro-choice. Here's why. Uh, you know, libertarianism is all about choice. So, you do what you want, okay? But Ron Paul is actually saying, no, we need to uh, defend the value of human life. And humans are internally valuable. Well, a pure libertarian would say, even if they are internally valuable, you still have the right to choose to kill them or not, you know? I'm going to catch heat for saying that. I'll probably edit that out. <clears throat> Alright, here's a big point that no one wants to talk about. And that is that Christianity is a superior uh, form of governance. Okay, it leads to a superior form of governance. And I would just say it's a flat superior way of life, but that's a lot harder to argue. It's still true, but it takes a long time to argue. But showing that it's a superior form of governance is relatively easily. Look at every successful country in the world, and they owe it to their Christian, Judeo-Christian influence, all right? Uh, with the exceptions of Israel, Japan, and Ch uh, China, every country which is successful, Western Europe, Canada, Central America, those few countries in South America that are worth anything, <coughs> you know, South Africa and those very few African countries that are worth anything, owe everything they have to a Judeo-Christian heritage. 
capitalism itself is founded in the principles of equality found in the Judeo-Christian heritage. Democracy itself founded in the Judeo-Christian heritage. Now you might go and say, oh, you know, Greece, Rome, all this. And that's true. But the republicanism we have is different from a pure democracy found in Greece. And while it is represented in Rome, the Roman Republic, Rome was heavily influenced by Christianity as well. Okay, And if you look at the pre- and post-Christianity Rome, on the one hand you might say, well, post-Christianity it all fell apart. Well, that's true, but it's a little more complicated than that. I'm not going to touch on that right now. But just look at Europe as a whole, okay, and the other places I've mentioned, Canada, U.S., um, and you can see that Christian influence there. China, and those, those exceptions I named, also owe it to Christian influence, but in a different way. China and Japan copied the U.S. That's how they got wealthy. And the U.S. has that Christian heritage, so they have a pseudo-Christian heritage. China is only successful because of its adopted capitalism. So it's a communistic government with an open market. Now, the whole principles of open market uh, derive from the Judeo-Christian heritage, which led to capitalism because of, as I mentioned before, principles of equality and free choice, right? So Christianity and, and Judaism are the only religions which say uh, humans have the uh, ability to decide for themselves. They have a free will. Other religions don't claim free will, and if they do, they don't justify it. They just kind of say, yeah, we have a free will. Christianity and Judaism say we have free will because God created us with free will. Also, atheists, agnostic, people like these, um, who don't address the question of free will, have no reason to believe in free will, except there are uh, you know, uh, evidentialists who say, I experienced free will, therefore it exists. But this is very dumb. Because you experience things all the time that aren't true. Anytime you had to do a double take at a TV screen, you thought you saw one thing, but another thing was playing. Anyone who's had to do a double take should recognize that evidentialism is crap. Okay, And um, really, if you're uh, a scientist, a naturalist, an atheist, or an agnostic, you should prefer to think that the world is determinate. That uh, everything sort of logically follows from an initial first move. Now, whatever that initial first move may have been is a point of contention, I understand. But it shouldn't be that you think it's free will and you can just do whatever you want. Because even in reality, you can't do whatever you want. Even if we have free will, it's at least free will amongst constraints. But that whole free will discussion is for another time. The point is not whether or not free will exists. The point is that Christians have long taught that free will exists. So that perception justifies capitalism. All right? Whether or not it's a good perception is an entirely different conversation. Uh, and uh, Israel, of course, you know, was brought together artificially from the agreement of several European nations and the U.S. and various others. And these were all Christian nations, right? So it's not like Israel just existed of its own volition. It existed due to Christian nations allowing it for it to exist. So they owe us too, okay? And you can say, you know, Israel was there before Christianity. And that's true. But it got overrun and annihilated. So, it's not really a valid point. Uh, last point, social conservatism. Now, everyone discounts social conservatism, but here's the thing. Economics is politics, and politics is economics. And, oh, and this is another point I was going to make with the war thing, so I'll make that too. I'm a political science major and an economics major. I'm a double major. And I recognize that votes can create policies which stimulate or diminish the economy, that stimulate or diminish particular firms and industries, even particular people. You can make or break a person's wealth with policies, taxing, you know, uh, things like that. You can, so that's how politics equals economics. Economics also equals politics because you can buy votes. Marketing, uh, even if you go out of the voting, lobbying, there's other ways the political system is influenced besides voting. Um, funding think tanks, just paying for people to run as candidates takes a lot of money. So money equals, so economics equals politics. Politics equals economics. They're one and the same. Even if you look at a vote, it really is an amount of money. They're both units accounting for your ability to use power in a way you prefer. They're both expressions of utility, if you can wrap your mind around that. So 
So politics is economics. But here's the missing thing. Politics is economics is values. Okay? So your values are going to determine your preference, and your preference is going to determine how you behave economically, how you behave politically. It all goes back to values. Here's another thing. A political system is completely empty without values to go into it. All right? So, you know, voting doesn't mean anything if people don't vote, right? And if people vote, they have to have a reason for voting. If you don't have a reason to vote, you're not going to go vote. And if you don't go vote, there's no political system. So you do have a reason for voting. And when you vote, you express values. So those values are every bit as important as the act of voting itself. Do you see that? Additionally, when you go out and spend money, you're not going to spend money if you don't have a reason to. Now, I'm using the term values very generally, generally because it can mean anything from, I value eating. You know, I just like eating. And it can be as simple as that. Or I need to eat. Needs are values as well. It can be something as simple as I need to eat, all the way something to as complex as, I think flying to the moon is going to lead to technological advances, and that's going to benefit everyone, so we should do that. Okay? Whatever you have a value in, whatever you place stock in, whatever you desire, whatever you like, whatever makes you happy, all right? These are all kinds of ways of describing value or utility. Those are two words we like to use for that. Now, values also ties back to your worldview, okay? So your values are also your moral values. Do you see that? And from your moral values stem all of your other values. It could be that your morals are so hardcore that you don't need to eat. I don't need to eat. I'm just a Buddhist monk, and I'm so hardcore about Buddhism. You know, food doesn't even matter. It's all about nirvana, bro, okay? So you can see how that's going to determine your preference. Even if it's irrational, it doesn't really matter. Values are going to determine how you're going to vote and how you're going to spend your money. And how you're going to vote and how you're going to spend your money, it's all interrelated. And because it's all interrelated, and because they're all equal in effect, politics is every bit as potent in shaping the world around you as is economics, as in cultural values. So they're all equal of equal potency, um, so they're all equally important to take into consideration to that person you're going to vote for. So Santorum is a social conservative. Ron Paul is a social liberal. And I would contend that social conservatism is better than social liberalism. Let me tell you why. Social conservatism has three things going for it. It has tradition, and you say, oh, tradition's terrible. Actually, Edmund Burke would argue with you. And go read about the founder of what we call conservative now, now conservatism nowadays. That's Edmund Burke. Even Ron Paul likes the guy, and he talks about why tradition, why tradition is important for the legitimacy of your rights. Your rights are only legitimate because the generation before you gave them to you. Okay, that's the that's it in a nutshell. And you can see there's a logical problem there. Well, what about the first people that had rights? Well, that's different, okay? And he can get into his details on that. But anyway, so the legitimacy of rights, the fact that gradualism is superior. You don't want to just change everything all of a sudden. You want a gradual change, all right? This is social conservatism. Also, as I mentioned, Christianity. When people talk about social conservatives, about 92% of self-identified social conservatives are Christians. There's an 8% that are secular social conservatives. All right, and then lastly is the idea, the idea of American identity. That's a social conservative value. So in this increasing age of globalization, there really is no America anymore, okay? And um, actually, Ron Paul supporters should be able to sympathize with this heavily because they're strict constitutionalists and they want to go back to the founder's intent, and they want to cut out um, foreign sovereignty over America. And um, that's a value that St. Torm shares. All right, so there's my done ranting. St. Torm isn't as bad as you think. I hope uh, a little bit of that helped. My next video will be the conclusion. And um, hope you like it. Take care.